Sleeping in sunshine and fog, the Pacific coast was the homeland of primitive tribes for many centuries. It was only 450 years ago that Juan Cabrillo claimed it for the throne of Spain. But its barren hills and valleys remained remote and unexplored for another 200 years. By the middle of the 18th century, there were signs that Spain's claim might be threatened. Russian outposts for salmon fishing and fur trading had been established north of Spain's west coast holdings. And that was a bad sign. The next thing you knew, those vodka drinkers would be moving south into territory that Spain considered hers. Possession being ten-tenths of the law in those days, the Spanish king directed his minions to establish missions along the coast of Alta California. This would be the first step towards establishing Spain's presence on those distant shores. Spanish soldiers would protect the missions which would be run by the Franciscan order of the Roman Catholic Church. The Franciscans would reap a harvest of converts from among the indigenous peoples and the Russian menace would be halted. Soldier Gaspar de Portola was promptly named governor of Alta California. He and Franciscan missionary Junipero Serra were sent to do the job. On Friday, July 14, 1769, they left San Diego to make the northward trek. The trail they blazed has come to be known as El Camino Real, the King's Highway. Among the members of the large expedition was Father Juan Crespi. He kept a precise diary of the journey, noting all physical landmarks, water sources, and types of vegetation. From this record, we have the first account of Europeans treading the ground of modern Carlsbad. Listen to an excerpt from his diary as we follow that same route. Monday, July 17, at 3 in the afternoon, we left the camp east of Petaquitos Lagoon, following the valley in a northerly direction. In a little while, we climb a very grassy hill without rocks in open country, then travel over mesas that are in part covered with grass and other shrub unknown to us. Aside from this, all the land is well covered with grass and is mellow. After traveling about a league, we descended to a valley full of elder in which we saw a village, but without people. In passing, we named this valley San Simon de Mica. It is not very far from the shores, and at the end of it we saw an estuary, although the sea was not visible. We continue on our way in the same northerly direction, over the hills and broad mesas supplied with good pasture, and to a small, very green valley, which has a narrow plain some 50 varas wide. We pitch camp on this slope of the valley on the west side. The water is collected in pools and we notice that it flows out of several springs forming about its marshes or stagnant pool, covered with rushes and grass. We named this place Santa Sinfarosa. The Spaniards continued their northward journey, reaching San Francisco Bay before returning to San Diego. The Franciscan fathers then set about founding various missions. One was the famous mission San Luis Rey, founded in 1798 and situated in present-day Oceanside. Its lands extended 11 leagues from east to west and thus included much of what is present-day Carlsbad. Mexico gained its independence from Spain in 1821. Its view of the missions was that they had served their purpose and that the Indians who had worked the mission lands should be freed from servitude. This sentiment became official in 1826. The governor of Alta California proclaimed the emancipation of all Indians qualified to become Mexican citizens. Most of the Spanish soldiers sent to protect the mission settlements had returned to Spain. Those who chose to remain called themselves Californios and they covetously eyed the mission lands. They pressured the Mexican government to secularize those huge tracts to take the land away from the Padres and let private individuals have it. They claimed that this had been the intention of the Spanish crown centuries before. Thus, on August 23, 1835, the Mission San Luis Rey and its holdings were turned over to Pio Pico and Pablo de la Portillo. 
As with the secularization of other missions, this led to the formation of many large ranchos. The one with the most effect on Carlsbad's history is the one called Rancho Aguajerianda, granted to Juan Maria Romaldo Marone II in 1842. Marone had many things going for him. Born in San Diego in 1808, he was literate, a rare skill in those days, and he had a talent for civic leadership. He had married Felipa de Jesus Osuna, who was the daughter of Juan Maria Osuna, the owner of Rancho Santiguito. He was also a very bright man and was well respected in San Diego society. He was twice elected regidor in San Diego and he served as mayor of San Diego in 1848. After acquiring the rancho, things went well with Marone for several years. He built this three-room adobe hacienda and developed a herd of cattle and horses. The Marone house is located near the center of the rancho on a hill overlooking Aguajerianda Creek. It was a long, narrow building containing five rooms all in a row. It was 60 feet long by 18 feet wide on the outside. The walls were two feet thick. It was aligned north and south with a full-length porch on the east side. There were no connecting doors between the rooms, but each had a door to the porch and a window on the west side of the house. The walls were 12 feet high with an open beam ceiling. The ridge pole was made of two squared pine logs brought down from Palomar Mountain. The squared beams were laid end to end and resting on a middle partition. The living room was on the north and was heated by a fireplace at one end of the building. The master bedroom was next to the living room and did have a door between. The kitchen was a lean-to on the north end of the building. Marone and his wife divided their attention between the ranch and the old mission, where he also served as administrator to unclaimed mission lands. They still conducted their various hotel and real estate activities in San Diego, traveling from the rancho by ox cart, a full day's trip. With the invasion of California by the U.S. Army in 1846, the Marones left the ranch and went to stay in San Diego. Marone never set foot on Aguajerianda again. He died in San Diego on September 23, 1853, leaving the rancho to Philippa and their children. In 1855, Philippa and Sylvester Marone, who was variously described as either Juan Marone's son or younger brother, returned to Rancho Aguajerianda. Beginning in 1858, the Marone family gave a series of mortgages and leases on the ranch that confused the issue of ownership in later years. The records show that on December 11, 1865, the Marone heirs finally deeded the rancho to Francis Hinton, who had leased the ranch from them in 1860. It had been then that he persuaded a young Irish immigrant named Robert Kelly to come on board as ranch foreman. Kelly ran Rancho Aguajerianda well, with fairness and a sense of responsibility to everyone involved. According to his niece, Elizabeth Kelly Gunn, he bought a half interest in the ranch shortly after Hinton took title to it from the Marones. Kelly died in November 1890, and because he had no family of his own, the ranch passed into the possession of his nine nephews and nieces. But now, Let's backtrack just a little to the last few years of Robert Kelly's life when some things were stirring just outside the boundaries of Rancho Aguajerianda. One of Robert Kelly's civic-minded acts had been the deeding of 40 shoreline acres to allow a railroad track to be built connecting Los Angeles and San Diego. The first train that chugged through what would become Carlsbad was operated by the California Southern Railroad. But in 1882, when this historic event occurred, there was no town to be seen, just open chaparral and a 127-acre homestead owned by Lafayette Tunnison. Discouragement over the lack of water led Tunnison to sell his land in 1883 to John A. Fraser, who promptly set to work digging a well. Much to everyone's but his own amazement, he not only struck an artesian spring 400 feet down, but he went on to find a reservoir of mineral water in an even deeper well. 
Frazier shared sips of water with thirsty train passengers who alighted from the train while the engines were serviced at Frazier's station. Soon, word spread that the sparkling mineral water had miraculous healing properties, curing any number of aches and pains. The water's fame eventually reached the ears of Gerhard Schutte, a German immigrant whose retirement dream was to build a community of his own. He envisioned a town of gracious homes and small farms, with the fewest possible commercial establishments. Schutte paid a visit to Fraser Station and agreed that it was just the place that he had been looking for. He wrote back to an old friend and potential partner, Samuel Church Smith, in Columbus, Nebraska, to tell him of his find. And the Carlsbad Land and Mineral Water Company soon became a reality. Schutte as president and Smith as secretary recruited the necessary number of other directors for their new enterprise. When they found that the mineral waters were chemically identical to those in the famous Bohemian Spa of Carlsbad, spelled with a K, they decided that their town would become the famous American Spa of Carlsbad, spelled with a C. The next step was to lay out the new roads, marked with eucalyptus seedlings, and build their own houses. Then, they planned a promotional campaign to attract others to their new town. Seeing that these people were serious, the Santa Fe Railroad built a depot at the bottom of Gerhard Schutte's garden. The town founder had built a splendid Victorian Queen Anne mansion overlooking his domain to shelter his family of nine children. By contrast, his partner Smith built a simple craftsman cottage on the Ocean Bluffs. Another partner, Vice President D.D. Wadsworth, built an identical but reverse design version of the Schutte House on an adjacent site, leading to the structure's later identity as the Twin Inns. It was the director's hope that their homes would serve as an encouragement for others to settle in their new town. Their grandest project was construction of the four-story Carlsbad Hotel. It was hailed as nature's sanitarium, where the famous mineral waters were to be had for the asking. Unfortunately, Carlsbad, like the rest of Southern California, was riding a short-lived wave of prosperity. Even as Carlsbad was being developed in 1888, land values were beginning to fall, and the financial panic of 1890 finished the great land boom. In 1890, there were 39 registered voters in Carlsbad, but by 1894, there were only six. All the participants in the Carlsbad Land and Mineral Water Company had seen their fortunes dwindle and disappear. The hotel burned down in 1896. Property taxes had forced Smith to sell his house and land and move to San Diego in 1895. And the other two directors of the Carlsbad Land and Mineral Water Company also disappeared from the scene. Only Gerhard Schutte remained to stroll down his garden path and meet the daily train.